this idea that these tech companies need to kind of overturn the existing order. Um, that strikes me as something that is pretty valuable if you're an entrepreneur. Um, it becomes problematic, though, when that philosophy is kind of the animating ideology behind the world's largest companies. Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. If you ask 10 people what Peter Thiel is best known for, you'd probably get 10 different answers. To some, he's an entrepreneurial guru, the guy who founded PayPal and invested early in Facebook. To others, he's a libertarian provocateur. So seasteading is one of the things that you've been interested in for years, this idea that we're going to basically create in effect, states that are going to be on platforms in the sea that I think are sort of going to be libertarian utopias. What got you interested in this, and well, it where was, is it at now? It was uh, Milton Friedman. I, I sort of knew Milton Friedman a little bit, and his grandson, Pat, Patrick Friedman. Or you might know him as the guy who teamed up with Hulk Hogan to sue and ultimately bankrupt Gawker. Do you believe you've set a dangerous precedent in secretly suing Gawker in connection with its publication of the Hulk Hogan video? I don't think so. You know, you know you, you st let's start with uh, the, you know, the facts of the case. Max Shafkin explores all these sides of Teal in his book, The Contrarian. Teal has no shortage of controversial opinions. But the thing I found really fascinating about Max's book was that for a guy who portrays himself as this anti-establishment outsider, Peter Thiel is kind of the consummate insider. The growth hacking techniques he pioneered at PayPal are now used by startups all over Silicon Valley. His technology company, Palantir, has become embedded in governments around the world, including the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency and the British Health Service. And he was a key figure in the election of Donald Trump. I am proud to be gay. I am proud to be a Republican. But most of all, I am proud to be an American. So I want to talk to Max about what makes Peter Thiel tick. Because he's not just reshaping Silicon Valley. Through his venture capital, his companies, and his backing of right-wing political movements, he's reshaping technology, politics, and entire countries. Here's my conversation with Max Shafkin. Look, I want to dive into all sorts of aspects of this book, but uh, I mean, I guess just to start, I mean, it sounds like you met Peter Thiel a couple of times um, and had a couple of interactions, sort of either maybe out of the context of this book specifically. But uh, what, what's your what was your read on him as a person? Yeah, um, so he's he's one of these people who is very hard to to know, um, and you know that that's part of the part of what intrigued me about the book, honestly, just because I felt like you know no one had really gotten at him as a human being. He's somebody who has these. Um, you know, basically myths that have that have been created and that he is he has created, I think, had taken a, a big role in creating about himself. You know, one is the this kind of like heroic Ayn Randian kind of libertarian entrepreneurial superhero. Um, and then there's this kind of like left wing myth, which is like Teal as this like vampiric um, supervillain who is like, you know, sucking our data through all these <laughs> companies and and, you know, contributing to all these like nefarious political causes. And we have this like vague sense that somehow the data thing and the political thing are connected, but maybe we're not sure. Um, and and obviously there's a person there, there's a man and and he's, you know, got had lived this like really interesting life that, you know, and it's 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 shaped those myths, but it and it's shaped him. And he's also, you know, just just full of uh contradictions. He's term myth a lot there. And I think that does a lot of work in in the whole book in a sense that he there's a sort of disconnect between how he's he wants to be portrayed and his different hedges and the, his public persona and his self-interest. And there's a lot of sort of ambiguity there. And did he acknowledge any of that when you spoke to him, that there is this sort of well, game almost that's well, being played? I don't want to, I, I, I can't speak to anything that happened, you know, you know, the conversation was off the record. So I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to speak to anything he said. Sure. Um, I do think one thing that people miss about tech broadly, and this includes Teal, but 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 other important tech figures like including Musk, um, is that a lot of these guys 
you know, style themselves as as these amazing inventors and technologists. They're also, you know, great marketers. And I think Teal is kind of underrated as a marketer. Like what he sort of figured out is that he could create this persona, um, kind of Ayn Randian superhero, public intellectual, um, and kind of package that and use that as a, a vehicle for for influence. And and that's something that he's done, I think, you know, very effectively. I also think that, you know, he's created both the myths, right? He's created the kind of hero myth, but he's also played a role in creating this, you know, the supervillain myth. Like he he has very much embraced that and used that um, both as a way to kind of like create controversy and kind of activate his followers. You know, any anybody who's sort of familiar with right wing politics of the last 30 years will recognize some of these things. You know, the trolling, like like doing things to provoke deliberately. That's been a big part of his kind of thing for, for most of his career. He's also used it to sell um, technology. You know, Palantir, a, a lot of Palantir critics, they, they tend to talk about Palantir in this kind of big brother way, which there's some truth to that, but 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 what they don't realize is that Teal has, has driven that narrative as well and kind of really embraced the idea of Palantir as this all-powerful, vaguely scary thing. Because of course, if you're a customer of data mining firms, you want the scary thing. You're not like you don't care about privacy. You're you're you want the you want the evil uh, you know Sauron technology, and that's exactly you know that's precisely what he did. So so yeah, I think he's just this amazing myth maker you know on both sides, and he's been very good at getting both you know his followers and also his critics to kind of do things that 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 work towards his interest. Yeah, like I want to talk, dive into Palantir a little bit because I mean it's been this personal fascination of mine for, for almost a decade now. In 2012, I uh, did one of their training programs in at Tyson's Corner in DC when they were trying to court like you write in the book, how they're trying yeah. to court like mid-level army officials and stuff to kind of normalize it into their culture. And I, this, this nonprofit sent me to take this course to see if it'd be useful for like development projects. And I was the only non-uniformed sort of person there. But what became totally clear in this day-long demo of the tech was that there was a, like myth is, would be the most generous way of putting it. Like this was a fully orchestrated demonstration of a capacity that was kind of being like, it was a mock demo, right? Of right. Like the capacities and, and the thing they were selling was that with more data, you can get more meaning, which was the exact opposite problem that governments were facing, right? Like all this data they were collecting and they had no meaning out of it. And they were selling this like idea that they could bring clarity out of this chaos and all of this. And it just, it, it felt to me right then like a grift almost. Like yeah. what are they doing here? So I, I think that the way you describe that company gets at so many aspects of him and Silicon Valley. And I, I'd love to just hear more what you think about them and, and maybe just like what you, what they are first to like, and then we can dive into to yeah. you know, how they evolved. Oh man, I, I wish we had talked. I mean, you know, cause some of the most eye opening conversations I had for the book were, were th this kind of thing that you just relayed to me, just early users who were really able to kind of cut through um, some of the hype. Um, so Palantir, broadly speaking, is a um, data integration tool. It's it's a piece of software that, in theory, helps um, large organizations sort of sift through data that they've already collected and, yeah. in theory, you know, find insights. So those could be kind of as mundane as, like, you know, what parts for this product that we're manufacturing, um, you know, are, are like stuck in Asia right now and we need to get them, you know, speed up, speed up the delivery. Yeah. Or it could be like, and this is how Palantir was originally sort of sold. It could be like, let's find the potential, you know, terrorists who are, um, you know, buying plane tickets today, you know, b between New York and Los Angeles or something like that. That was the demo we did. It was like a day of like more and more data. And then like the final decision was like a bomb maker is going to show up on this street corner at this time. And we've now found him. Right. Like right. That was the nature and, and, of this thing. And that, you know, what's so crazy about kind of what you just described, and I heard this from other people, is how different it was kind of from the way that people talked about Palantir in the press. And it's mm. not as if, it's not as if like we in the press didn't, like we we reported on those demos and we would often say that they were demos, right? But like you'd have to go all the way to the bottom of the like first section or whatever. And so what it ended up being, and in my understanding of it was just, 
you know, it it was for many years basically like a way to create a visualization for that would and, and a way to kind of impress your bosses or or whatever, mm. make make it seem like you're doing um uh you 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 know you're using the latest and greatest when in fact you're mm. kind of just doing something that's like pretty basic that a lot of people were already doing anyway. And yeah. and Palantir was kind of very clever, honestly, at at taking what they had, which was investment from the CIA um, through InQtel, which is this uh, venture capital firm that is backed by the CIA, and some early pilot customers and sort of spinning a narrative where they were this, you know, next generation, you know, military contractor. Mm -hmm. And they use that to then sell to um, corporate customers because, of course, corporate customers, um, you know, are, are 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 no more or less sophisticated than these military customers, and they're apt to kind of be taken with the military grade technology th story that Palantir is selling. Um, they were both beneficial to each other, right? Like, yeah, the, as you mentioned, the business customers were needed so that government contracts would feel like they weren't just supporting an industry solely, and the biz and the military contracts sort of gave this sort of sense of power to the company and mystique. That business mystique that that corporate clients wanted yeah absolutely and i think what basically happened like over 12 years or so um they slowly sort of built a product that got better and it went from being something where a critic might call it you know vaporware to being like you know a technology that maybe maybe can't do everything or whatever but yeah. it does it does it does actually have provide some value and then it gets uh, turbocharged essentially by you know by the election of Donald Trump, and then the pandemic comes. Pandemic is also really good for Palantir. Now we're looking at a you know fifty billion dollar so company um, that yeah. that as you said you know even going back um, you know less than a decade did not look especially impressive as a piece of technology. I mean, there's a bit of sort of a fake it till you make it sort of thing that was going on there, which obviously is like an old Silicon Valley playbook to a certain degree, right? Like, and that was part of PayPal too. It was like grow, 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 and then eventually you'll maybe be profitable. Um, and that's kind of core to to a lot of companies at the moment. But I wonder if th that villain myth that you mentioned there too actually really played into this here, that, and whether the media and academics have kind of almost enhanced that power that he claims to have with this technology by overstating its power. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And I think, and this is not to say that like the people who are writing about I mean, Palantir has been involved with some some really problematic things. There was yeah. this um, proposal to like you know slime Glenn Greenwald, you know the the uh, the journalist who's connected to Edward Snowden. Uh, Palantir apologized, disavowed, and and there was this, a, a continued pattern of this sort of thing. So like, I think it's correct that um, that journalists are writing about this stuff because because I do think that like because there were actual you know, harms right? yeah I mean, yeah any time a company uh, even if a company yeah. is like not not as capable it says if it's doing if it's doing bad things then then I think it's you know we uh, as journalists you know like have to write about it um but I do think that teal was very clever in sort of taking the negative press and kind of turning around and using it as a selling point I kept thinking reading the, the your accounts of the, exactly that the the many connections between Teal and, and and Facebook, and that that's very much a Facebook playbook too. Is the critique of the power of the all sort of powerful ad targeting that it, and, and even sort of the way Shoshana Zuboff promotes sort of the powerful behavioral manipulation capacities of this ad tech um, is great for them because advertisers love that. Of course, they want to think that. They're, the tool they're using is all powerful, right? But so that critique is kind of um, embedded almost in the sales pitch of, of some. Of yeah, these yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like you know, many of the most animated Facebook critics are basically like saying the same thing that like Facebook sales team has been saying for right. for like, like two. We're like two all decades. powerful, right? We can make anyone do anything. Yeah, we yeah. can change people's <laughs> minds. Um, exactly. And uh, <laughs> but but you know, but it's not to take away. Like I do think that you know Zuboff's critique, like like uh, these. These critiques are are valid and are worth taking and seriously, and then very yeah. real, right? And it's just ways. interesting the 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 way, like as I said, teal and that like the the, the sort of teal approach to business is mm. is to kind of turn that turn that some of that stuff into an advantage. And how do you balance that when you're writing about them? Well, I, my goal was, as I said, to try to complicate both of those myths and mm. and to try to under to try to like understand where they end and where the where the real person begins but the other thing is like 
just try to leave them aside and just say like ask who is this guy and and where does he come from cuz 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 his personal story is is really interesting i mean as he's this kind of immigrant dyspeptic kind of misfit mm bounces around a lot, um, kind of washes out of, of kind of a traditional career path for, for somebody like him. You know, it's, he's mm. like, he's like a uber high achiever who like kind of washes out of corporate law and then, um, and then, and then wall street and comes back to Silicon Valley with like no obvious qualifications, um, no technological experience and basically takes over the whole industry. And in doing so creates this you know, totally, as I said, this kind of like really powerful identity and, and an identity that that shapes, you know, his the rest of his career, but also the the trajectory of this industry. Like to me, that's he's just an that's an insane figure. It's like a, a you know, one of the it's like Don Draper or Gatsby, one of these kind of self-created, you know, American heroes. And, you know, it's just it it, it has this it has a, a, the 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 all the qualities, I think, of of a lot of these kind of, um, you know, American myths. And of course, that's what what Teal, you know, is doing is, is like, and I think to some extent doing self-consciously like creating a new one. And the new one is, you know, the supremacy of Silicon Valley, the supremacy of, of technology founders, this idea that that the tech world is going to lead us to um, to a brighter tomorrow. And that, oh, oh by the way, it's going to probably enrich him, you know, tremendously. <laughs> One other, before we move on from talent here, one other aspect of it that I've been really intrigued by recently, um, around, the, I guess, the, the time Trump was elected, um, the Canadian ambassador in D.C., David McNaughton, stepped down as the Canadian ambassador and a few days later became the head of Palantir Canada. And, which is an... It's incredible that that's even allowed to begin with, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but it seemed to me that fits in with this strategy of the company to tap into the pandemic in a real way. I, I just want wondering how you can reflect on that last, this latest phase of the company, like embedding itself in the British healthcare system, trying yeah. to give pro bono services to the Canadian government to, to fight COVID. Um, I mean, this is more than just tracking a terrorist. This is like embedding these tools in government itself. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do think, I mean, uh, one thing that people forget about kind of like the rise of tech software, you know, software is eating the world or whatever. Like mm. that is a consumer, a lot of that is a consumer story. You know, yeah. we we found Gmail and like, oh man, it was so good. And, and it's like this kind of very bottom up innovation. But at the while that was happening, the industry was also, you know, basically selling to businesses. And yeah. one of the kind of like key things that this latest generation of, of software companies have sort of figured out is like how to use the kind of bottom up approach to, to embed within these large organizations and then ultimately like win big contracts. The, the, the real money, right, is going to always be in these large organizations, whether it's like Slack striking a deal you know, with General Motors or whatever, or Palantir, you know, taking over the British healthcare system or something like right, that. Like multi-million dollar a month licensing deals yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and so for... what Palantir did um, is is kind of follow the same approach that a lot of tech companies have, which is like initially go to these mid-level people, try to get them on board, try to get embedded within the, within the organization, create a situation where it starts to become a pain point for the if, the if the organization wants to get rid of it, it's like harder than just buying it. And so and and I think that's sort of happened with Palantir, um, not just with sort of defense work, which is where they started, but but in all these other areas. And, you know, it's the same kind of like network effect thing, right? Like once you have a bunch of employees using this technology, it starts to get easy. And like it's, you know, you as a manager, it's like not totally clear how you rip it out without pissing everybody off. And um, yeah, and I do think it it creates it creates serious questions. There's of course like the question of like data leakage, like somehow like are they training AA algorithms on proprietary data? Somehow you know somehow the data might be could be leaking across Palantir. That that strikes me as possible. I think sort of more problematic is just like importing these kind of Silicon Valley approaches to like data mining and privacy across like broad sectors of our economy where where everyone sort of starts acting like a Facebook product manager. A hundred percent. Look, I think that's the key there, right? Like, I think that's the key. And, and not just across society, but in particular in how we govern ourselves. I mean, 
we're bringing in a, it's not just bringing in a tool, it's bringing in a way of thinking and operating and structuring and collecting data and using data. And I mean, there's this wonderful quote of in the book of one of the Teal Fellows that, saying that he was a, a fellow when it was still a tech fellowship, not a political one, right? Right, and, right. And, and I, I wonder if those things are inseparable and if part of the story of Palantir here is the kind of merging and of Teal himself is the merging of these that like the tech is political and the political is tech and like, yeah. we're kind of kidding ourselves if we think these things are separate. Well, and that's absolutely like what I think one of his key insights has been one of the key like uh, keys to his power is just is just understanding that tech and politics are inseparable and mm. that ideology can can feed technology and you know and vice versa and you know I've um, while I was writing the book, I was reading um, Cokeland by Christopher Leonard. Uh, you know, Cokeland's about um, uh, Coke Industries, you know, this this big industrial conglomerate that like, you know, uh, does like moves natural gas around the United States mm. and things like that. <laughs> and and of course, the, the, the founders of Coke Brothers, you know, use the, uh, use the profits from Coke Industries to create this like massive ideological project that like drastically reshaped, you know, American politics that led to all this like deregulation and lower mm. tax and a lot of stuff that, you know, happened under Reagan. And, and I think that what Thiel is doing with his kind of companies and his pol- political project is very similar to to the Koch brothers except it's not it's a it's a post industrial conglomerate it's these software companies that are not not explicitly connected to each other but are connected through this web of ownership right. and it's a um instead of attempting to like take over the the Republican party it's an attempt to take over the kind of far right ultra nationalist corner yeah. of the American electorate the, the Trump party or whatever and yeah. that's and that's what he's doing and it's the same kind of merging of business and and money and and he's been you know exceedingly you know effective at that so if the narrative of silicon valley like the political narrative was democratizing and liberatory originally and teal's ideology is libertarian ultimately or there has a pretense of it the way he's merged politics and tech is nothing is neither. Right. <laughs> it is not democratizing and it is not li- libertarian. It is, if anything, totalitarian, right? He's like building surveillance technology and and tools of social control and ways of cracking down on migrants. And like, these are not liberatory technologies. How does he square it? Does he tr- even try and square that? Well, I think no, basically. The answer is no. He's. I think he's somebody who's, who's sort of very comfortable um, with with contradictions and even kind of hypocrisy. I mean, I don't think he would use the word hypocrisy, but like, but but being a little bit, you know, playing both sides of a transaction. You know, that's something. You know, for his first career as an investor was as a hedge fund investor, and that's you know that's just like classic hedge fund behavior. You take both sides yeah. of the trade, and you know totally. you you try to limit your downside and maximize your upside. And I think Teal does that. You know, often ideologically. I mean, he's not a, like a like a libertarian in any like in the way that normal kind of like libertarians talk about themselves and right. and I think you know he doesn't although he sometimes talks about being a libertarian you know for for a long time he's he's sort of indicated that that's like kind of an incomplete uh, accounting you know in in 2009 he wrote this essay you know for uh, Cato Institute um that basically said hey I, you know I I'm not really a libertarian anymore you know I I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible and yeah. and and since then he's he's kind of pushed to this this thing where it's like it's like libertarianism, but only for tech billionaires. <laughs> it's like it's right. probably like kind of what his overall like worldview is, or or that you know um, tech companies should be allowed kind of like maximal freedom because they are going to be you know the, the ones to build the future. But but he's willing to like you know let the rest of the economy go towards a sort of more like nationalist or or, or far right or nationalist populist or whatever. I mean he's right. he's he's as I think as much a, a authoritarian as he is like a libertarian. No, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more with that one. Uh, but the other place that seems pretty clear where his view has now been sort of is now more of a part of our political debate is his almost anti wokeness and his. You know, he's almost proto proto anti woke. It seems. I mean, he was doing this before anybody else was, and kind of tapping into some of the same vein. And I, I wonder how you see that. Particularly, I've been watching this like University of Austin stuff over the last couple of weeks, and like him look like some of his money is behind that. 
The former New York Times opinion columnist Barry Weiss, known for her diatribes against cancel culture, announced Monday she's helping launch a new university that will be, quote, dedicated to the fearless pursuit of truth. It's interesting that he was sort of tapping into that before anybody else was, it seems. Absolutely. I mean, uh, certainly before anybody else in the tech world. I mean, sure. one, one thing that, I, you know, to me was sort of a revelation was realizing um, that, you know, people talk about the PayPal mafia. It's this idea that there's this, like, collection of early PayPal employees that invest in each other's companies and have gone on to, like, basically create the tech industry as it exists today and that they, you know, employees will often move from one PayPal ma mafia company to the other. Yeah. These guys collaborate. It's like a loose network. Um, um, it's not really though, people call it the PayPal mafia, but it really should be like the Stanford review mafia because most of these guys know each other, not from PayPal, but from the Stanford review, which is this, um, right wing newspaper that, that Peter Thiel started at Stanford in the eighties. And that was like his first entrepreneurial venture. And as you say, it was kind of a, a, a pioneer in this kind of like right wing provocation, this idea of, of kind of like the liberal establishment is pressing on us. And the only way we can do anything about it is by sort of saying the unsayable, um, mm -hmm. you know, walking right up to the line or, or crossing the line on race, a gender, gender identity. And then when we get attacked for it, um, that's an that's a that's an attack on our free speech, and that's mm. kind of like that was the approach of the Stanford Review, and I think you know we have a kind of a framework for talking about this now, like trolling. Um, the thing is, you know, Teal was a pioneer, but of course he wasn't working in a vacuum, and and in the eighties. You know, there were a bunch of these newspapers. Um, the the most famous one was at at Dartmouth, the Dartmouth Review, which um, you know one of the early editors was this guy Dinesh D'Souza, who's now you know famous you know uh, conservative provocateur. Ann Coulter had her newspaper at Cornell. So Teal was like swimming in this stream of kind of new right activism, and I think that 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 what he did was take that kind of mindset and graft it onto like the kind of countercultural aspects of what what tech was doing and sort of mm. take those two things and combine them in a way that that first like led to um, some really successful companies. You know, PayPal could be seen as kind of a libertarian activism project. project. Mm. And in fact, I think that's how Teal saw it. And a lot yeah. of Teal's stuff, I think, as he sees it, right, is 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 very much in this has an ideological component. Um, and so, so yeah, and, and of course he has been, you know, for, as you said, like 30 years, he's been talking about how political correctness is this, is this like huge problem. It's like the biggest problem. And I think that's, you know, that's what he liked about Donald Trump. A lot of, a lot of people in, in tech were sort of like befuddled by, mm. um, Peter Thiel's support of Trump because how could a, a futurist who happens to be gay, who happens to be an immigrant, who happens to have two Stanford degrees, you know, support this like reactionary anti-tech, you know, uh, uh, crazy guy from New York. And, and the answer is partly, I think self-interest, but partly that Trump made, you know, saying the unsayable, you know, trolling people, a big part of yeah. his candidacy. And Teal is somebody who's always seen that as sort of number one, a valid critique of liberal culture and also a, a winning strategy. Is it a coincidence that that worldview, that sort of angry, conservative, anti-institutional worldview has what's thrived the best on Facebook? The Shapiros of the world topping our most shared lists every day. The, like, is there a kind of coincidence? I, I, what's the relationship there? Yeah, yeah. I've thought about this a lot. So I think some of it is, um, I think there have to be multiple explanations. Now, mm. I do think that, number one, Zuckerberg is kind of libertarian and he's taken a, a he's he's heavily influenced by teal by his own account heavily influenced by teal you know in the world of business but i think you know, clearly in some ways politically when zuckerberg has has talked about sort of political speech or facebook's responsibility to the world like a lot of the time it sounds like he's he's talking like peter teal um and and there are people you know a lot of people in zuckerberg's inner circle who who espouse these politics so it can't be like a total coincidence um, that that kind of thing does well on, on Facebook. I assume some of it, or that is, they don't is, do the things to, right, to push that, back yeah. against it. Right. Well, right. And there's some, and yeah. I, and there's uh, there are anecdotes in my book about that. You know, at, at, at times I think Facebook, um, in in order to like court Donald Trump, make Trump happy, um, was you know, taking a hands off approach to to some of this stuff, um, and and was doing so, you know, at the behest and with with the help of of Peter Thiel. That said, I don't think it's exclusively, you know, kind of on the Facebook and 
conservative end. Like there must be some thing about how liberals have are using Facebook and have used Facebook that has caused them to not do as well. I mean, when you look at the, you know, the top 10 most shared stories on Facebook every day, it's it's um four Ben Shapiro's, like a Dan Bongino, three Fox News. It's 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 just dominated by by conservatives and in particular this by next this generation one, teals and cultures. Yeah, yeah, and this diseases, this right? tealist <laughs> stream. And I think that so some of that must be teal, but I but I suspect some of it has to do with the fact that the democratic establishment early on kind of embraced Facebook in a way that the right wing didn't. And mm-hmm. and as a result, like left-wing inter- internet culture became much much more institutional, right? It's mm. it's like really loud Obama supporters. Uh, they're not they're not they're not the people who are They're not insurgents. Yeah, in they're this. not yeah. and and of course as we've learned, outrage, you know, uh, totally. provocation, that's what sells. So I suspect that that is that that's part of the answer too that there was just more sort of energy um and and more more energy in terms of that kind of provocative approach on the right. But of course that also could be Teal's work because Teal is, you know, you're talking about the University of Austin, uh, which has, as you said, some people connected to Teal putting money into it. But the the thing is that Teal, basically because he sort of has all this money and he signaled a willingness to uh, to spend it, to, 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 to give it to candidates who uh, support his political positions, to um, ideological groups that that support his, you know, his work, et cetera. You know, he creates, he's a center of gravity, right? So he doesn't even necessarily have to tell um, the people backing the University of, of Austin or Barry YCU or whatever we're going to call it um, to, to do this because because they know that if they do it, there's teal money, you know, at the end of the rainbow and i think when we w- w- one of the um sort of best takes on this on that whole episode is that it didn't so much seem like they were trying to attract students as they were trying to attract more billionaire funders for their university and i think that is again that's the influence of teal yeah i saw that i think that that was really smart right that this was like a a public projection a signaling to his community that this was something they could be aligned with exactly and you know teal now and that's what uh, to me that's what makes teal's an interesting figure. Um, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Ashley Vance, wrote this book about Elon Musk. Mm. And in the in the book, Elon Musk is in every meeting, right? He's he's mm. designing the headlights. He's <laughs> he's firing people. He's like picking out screws. Um, Teal's not like that. Teal's a hands off figure. He's somebody who very much doesn't want to be in the room. He just wants to create the conditions. Um, so that what happens in the room is is what he wants. And mm. so people keep talking about, you know, these um Tealist political candidates, you know, JD Vance and Blake Masters. And and there's this suggestion, well, is, is Teal pulling the strings? You know, is he is he whispering and and my guess is yeah, but he doesn't even have to because when you write that big a check, he doesn't have to tell them to take a position that's favorable to cryptocurrency regulation. They know that that's that's the move to to make if you wanna, you know, win. Peter Thiel's support going forward. So, so I think his his power it's it's a it's real power, but it's a it's a soft power. It's not. It's often influence that's that's happening indirectly. And well, with him as well with people like Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, I'm wondering if it actually mat. Do we actually have to take their worldviews and beliefs and ideologies seriously? And are we just sort of going down that rabbit hole? And should we just judge them on what they build and do and fund and I mean, is that is that enough? Well, I think um, we need to do both, um, and I think so. I do think it's really important to 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 not be sort of seduced by the intellectual pretensions of, of somebody like Peter Thiel. You, we have to look at their at what they actually do, and and often what they actually do is is like much easier to explain in kind of crass. Um, in terms of, of of dollars and cents, and that of, often is, I think, the best explanation rather than some kind of you know highbrow like yeah. public intellectual thing. That said, the thing about Teal is that his identity as a public intellectual has been influential, and and he has followers. There's there are people who kind of identify as Tealists and who mm. who who read his books and and read them closely and and seek to emulate him, and and they those people. Um, have power and influence and are, and, are, and are doing things in the world. And so if you want to understand like why they're doing the things they're doing, I think it's helpful to also consider this this kind of like intellectual framework. Mm. And I think, you know, one one um, people have observed, you know, that that in some ways 
you know, Mark Zuckerberg is like more powerful than an elected official or something. You know, Mark Zuckerberg has, you know, an enormous amount of power. He controls the board of directors. He can basically do whatever he wants. And, you know, I think we need to understand what it, what motivates somebody like that, what, what their beliefs are, why they're doing the things they're doing. And, and so I think like understanding Teal is helpful in that. And it's helpful to understand, you know, why Facebook is the way it is. Um, if you want to have any hope of kind of reforming these companies, I think it's it's helpful to understand that stuff. Yeah, and I really struggle with this one. With it. So much of the pretense of an ideology or a sort of speculative effect these technologies will have. Um, I mean, it's it's fine and it, it can tell you something, but when you, when you describe in the book his role in the gig economy and the conne connection to labor movements, like, does it really matter if he was doing that to make markets more efficient? I mean, the ultimate effect is create, he's created a new economic model that kind of undermines traditional labor movements, right? And or forms of organization. And I, it's the same thing with, with Zuckerberg. Like, yeah, his vision might be to empower new voices, but the effect has been to undermine the state of media and the, its role in democracy, right? So like, I, I really struggle with how we separate these two. The intention yeah. versus reality, I guess, is another way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that we can separate them. And I do mm. think that, you know, understanding that, yes, like the gig economy was about, you know, creating a, a, a more seamless experience for taxi riders <laughs> or whatever right. is, you know, uh, like, OK, but but if you if you also know that there was an ideology behind it and that ideology was about, number one, you know, changing the relationship between workers um, and, and companies and also, number two, taking advantage of, you know, r legal loopholes and, and doing mm. basically regulatory arbitrage, re realizing that tech companies aren't going to be regulated the same way that old industry companies, you know, old line companies are or that tech companies will just be, be allowed to kind of get away with, um, you know, stuff that, that – that existing businesses can get away with. Like, so that to me, that helps us, you know, cut through the bullshit more quickly. And if yeah. and it, and if we don't, if we are not paying attention to the ideology, then I think it's it's easier to get kind of swayed by, you know, the the kind of utopian language. And I think it's very easy to get to to, to get seduced by it because these products are great. And even people who, you know, and, and I think it's important that even as we criticize them, like you have to sort of recognize that some of these products create value. Um uh, they may have very terrible consequences, but but like they they might be really useful for people, and and mm. I, and and we have to you know reckon with that and 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 understand that there's a tension there between you know uh, how our experience of of say Uber as an individual you know might you know be at odds with like Uber's impact on society. Yeah, I, w I wonder just just to close here if if he's actually ultimately in that sense not as much of a contrarian as he would like to have us believe. I mean he. He's at this been at the core of the business model that's, that Silicon Valley is built on. He's influenced some of those powerful CEOs in in the world. He has been at the center of U.S. government. He's this is a pretty establishment guy at the moment. Yeah. Well, I do think um, I do think that one thing that sort of people miss about Teal is that yeah, like he's a contrarian. He likes to. Be, he likes to be on the other side of a dorm room argument or whatever. Um, but his his real business successes have all come not from taking the other side of of the of the conventional wisdom, but but they generally come from selling into the conventional wisdom. Hmm. So you know, PayPal was 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 not the only didn't invent internet payments. It was one of dozens of companies. Every company in tech, every bank. They all had payments things, right? Elon Musk had a payments thing. Everyone had a payments thing, and what and Teal's kind of insight was basically how to sell into that and how to find how to find a lane for his payments thing. Palantir was selling into a bubble, and the bubble was, you know, the U.S. military needs to get better at data mining. Um, for, you know, Trump even, you know, he he sort of saw that there was this populism was growing, and mm. so so I think a lot of the time what he's doing is somewhat at odds with the with the with the mythology of always thinking different when a lot of the time it's just um it's 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 recognizing these movements and just being pretty ruthless as far as how you profit from them yeah and i i kept that's what i kept coming back to reading this book is that sort of 
is, is there a bigger takeaway here? And is this just a story of kind of a powerful rich guy who's part grifter, part salesman, part product developer? Or is, uh, is there a bigger moral to the story of him? Well, I, I am... A lot of people have focused on Teal's connections to, you know, parts of the right that mm. are are troubling. You know, Teal was deeply involved with the alt right, and um, you know, of course, he was a big supporter of Trump, and and so on. I think that there's sort of a more enduring aspect of Tealism that is, you know, more troublesome, and 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 something that I think is worth, you know, chewing on. And and well, there there are two really. One is this idea that these tech companies need to kind of overturn the existing order. Um, that strikes me as something that is pretty valuable if you're an entrepreneur. Um, it becomes problematic, though, when that philosophy is kind of the animating ideology behind the world's largest companies. Even people who are critical of the tech industry have accepted aspects of this narrative and have come to see, you know, disruption not as something that happens, not as an accidental thing that we sort of give a pass to um, in the name of progress, but as a social good in its of its in and of itself. And I think that is that's something that that's something that needs to be explored more. And the other thing is, you know, uh, uh, the the end point of Tealism is kind of is is the end of democracy. I think you know he's talked about he's talked about his his problems with democracy. He's he's you know uh, sort of pushed these techno utopian visions of sort of turning over you know turning over more and more of our lives to to these tech companies. And he's he's you know supporting politicians who are you know explicitly authoritarian. And and they're not these these guys aren't you know. Um, they're they're at the margins, but they're not mm. completely at the margins. They're they're some of them are on the ballot. They're going to be on the ballot in 2022. Um, we very will likely have another, uh, or I don't know, it's possible we'll have another Tealist uh, U.S. senator in either Blake Masters or, or J.D. Vance or both of mm. them. And so so this this worldview is is growing, and and I think I don't know. I mean, I think it's worth understanding kind of where it comes from. Um, and, and and for people who are committed to to, to resisting it, to, to using that and, and using that to arm themselves. No, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, thanks for uh, writing this book. And uh, this story is not over. I guarantee that. So hope you have a sequel in you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Taylor. You're scaring me. But uh, but yeah, I hope so. I'd love to, uh, to talk about this again sometime. That was my conversation with Max Shafkin. As always, you can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation in association with Antica Productions. The show is produced by Trevor Hunsberger, Debbie Pacheco, and Mitchell Stewart with associate producer Dania Ali. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every week.